we've been traveling, so we've been gone for. Uh, yeah, did years. I see you were in Europe recently? We were all over Europe. Yeah. Okay. You you weren't. Were you close to where the flooding happened? Uh, no, that that was sort of northern uh, Germany. So my family's in southern Germany, but we were in Italy oh, okay. and uh, oh. and then in uh, in the. Uh, the Italian Riviera, and then in Monte Carlo, and then in Nice, and then in uh, and in Austria, then in Germany. So we had a we had a full uh, a full go. Oh, cool. We were back on the road, just back, just having fun. <laughs> so, sounds like a good trip. Yep, it was great. We actually also did our uh, before we did all that. We did our boot camp down in Miami. So we were one of. Uh, there were only a hundred live events going on in the United States, and oh yeah. Yeah, and we were one of them. We were just all so aching. Everybody got vaccinated, and uh, we were just like, let's do this thing. You know, let's just all get out and do something. Cause, yeah, that sounds good. Are, are you going to be at the Traders Expo in September? Yes. Okay. I uh, I might be there for that one as well. I haven't finalized my plans, but <laughs> I actually have a... I'd love to see you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just happened to have a family reunion in Denver a few days before that, so I'm going to... Go to that and then fly over to Vegas for a few days, too. For nice. The, I'll take the edge off the family reunion. <laughs> yeah. All right. If, um, if you're ready to go. Sure. I'm all set up. And, uh, okay, I'm going to start the recording now. All right. Thank you, David. And uh, as you guys just overheard us uh, saying, you know, we are finally back to traveling again. And you guys who know us, you know that uh, travel is a big part of our life. And, um, you know, sort of being out there speaking about what we're doing is is a, is a huge component to uh, why we do this stuff. Um, today, you know, this this was a little bit of a one off for me when when David said, you know, what's your favorite technical indicator? I immediately started thinking about, well, you know, I don't really use technical indicators. But then, uh, you know, Julie reminded me I've got some highly technical stuff. It's just they're not in the realm of your typical technical indicators. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you guys a deep dive into uh, into this one indicator, show you how this thing works, show you exactly what it is that uh, that I do with it, and um, you know, it's no black box. We do have, uh, uh, you know, a trading room and a um, sort of hand holding that goes along with it. If if that's something you're into, I'll talk about that at the end. But you know, first, you know, let me just tell you where we're coming from. That's uh, that's Julie and me. So we are full time professional equities traders and analysts. We've been at this since uh, 1999. We did this. As part of our graduate work, uh, we both have uh, master's degrees and PhDs, and uh, you know, masters are on the business side. PhDs are in organizational psychology, so it's all about how you know organizations work and what makes them profitable and what makes things uh, tick when there's mergers and all that kind of stuff. But um, essentially, we started doing um, statistical analyses and work with folks down on the New York Stock Exchange in back in 19, it's going to be like 1996, 1997. So that's when we started doing all this stuff. And, you know, part of that was grad students need data. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of data when you're looking at stock market, uh, you know, tick history and all that stuff. It was all available. We were able to just, you know, download huge reams of information. We got to know people down on the floor of the exchange. You know, NYSE is, is a very different kind of a thing than, than the electronic exchanges. Uh, there was somebody on the other side of every trade. We, we really managed to put together a big uh, database in our graduate work of what it was that makes market ticks and what it is that can make you... Uh, as Bernard Baruch said, anticipate the anticipators, right? That's the, the key to successful speculation. And over the years, we do a bunch of publishing. You guys know, you know, we publish a ton of stuff um, about what we do. We do um, a lot of uh, training, a lot of stuff that's, you know, with, with guys who used to be market makers, with guys who are uh, from the other side of the fence who are just retiring or, or deciding they want to do something else or deciding they want to do something in addition. But it all comes back to we've got a real good handle on why it is that markets work the way that they do. And we're not really trying to find, you know, like an indicator that beats the street. We're trying to find something 
um, that works with the markets and gives us a heads up of what's coming our way next. So we've done stuff in all these magazines. I think down at the bottom is a book where they featured the uh, the style of trading that I do. Everything else is stuff that I've written. I've written a bunch more in, in uh, uh, periodicals and journals and things. I also did a bunch of books, right? Um, PhDs publish. This is something that we do and it's something we enjoy doing. Around the Horn, A Trader's Guide to Consistently Scoring in the Markets. That's the thing that started it all. That is, I like to tell people it was originally called a multivariate analysis of covariance in the United States equities markets. And, you know, my publisher talked us into, for obvious reasons, let's frame this thing around a metaphor. What sport do you like? Baseball, I said. He said, how about football? I said, how about baseball? But all of these books are just about the stuff that we do every day, right? So there's like worldwide releases, World Cup trading and uh, and Beat the Street are, uh, you know, Italian and, and worldwide respectively. But around the horn, that's the one that had all the patterns uh, that made up what it was that we were doing and had all the statistics behind them and um, allowed us to feel like we were, you know, working in, in an environment of, you know, let's say uncertainty sometimes, but we were able to put probability on our side. And that's really what it's all about when it comes to trading. So everything that I've done over the last uh, 25 years amounts to, I want to figure out how to see the human behavior that's coming our way in the market based on uh, some chart patterns based on the, you know, the things that are going to predict or have predictive validity in terms of who's going to get afraid, who's going to get greedy, who's going to look to uh, um, you know, establish a position, who's looking to take it off. So, so when I looked at this originally and was you know, trying to figure out sort of what it was that I was going to talk about uh, um, for David, because we always you know, try, to, try to do these things, I think he puts together a great event. Um, you know, I thought about indicators and indicators in general. And, you know, this is sort of a list of what I find wrong and what I find right in the world of indicators. And the problem with most indicators, right, if you're using moving averages or using stochastics or, um, you know, any of this stuff that's, you know, these oscillators and elevators and all that stuff is summarizing for you what's on the left side of the chart. And that makes it inconsistent because it's it's showing you what already happened. And then what you're trying to do is take that summary and play it forward a little bit and say, this is what I think is most likely going to be what's going to happen. But the goal with an indicator, if you're going to put something together, what you want is something that has predictive validity in being able to tell you what's going to happen on the right side of the chart over there where stuff hasn't happened yet. And if you use a solid statistical model to do this, it's going to skew the odds in your, in your favor. And, you know, that's really what I'm going to talk about today. Um, it's one model in particular that we use. We do a bunch of stuff, right? I've got stuff that I've done um, in hedge funds. I've got algo stuff that I've, that I've put together over the years. This is just a, a simple kind of a setup that I use in our own trading and our trading with the guys, right? To, you know, when we work with folks, it's, you know, I tell people all the time, we get 600 people a year who apply uh, to work with us to go to these boot camps. We accept 40 people. Um, and that's because this is not a blanket approach to this is how you, you get into the markets and you trade the markets. This is all about you've got to fit your psychology. You've got to fit your discipline. You've got to fit your relationship with money and everything has to come together. And then if you get in front of tools that are statistically reliable, you've got a real chance of, uh, of knocking one out of the park. So again, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're, having, and, uh, you know, the fact that we've only been back in the United States for a couple of days here and we're going to a game tells you, you know, we like baseball. So if the baseball metaphor here bothers you in the next example, then, you know, just think of it as, uh, as a two SD gap reversal because the trade itself, I called Baltimore chop. So this is a two standard deviation opening gap and the two standard deviations is in terms of volatility. And we know that volatility has a bunch of characteristics that makes it uh, really adaptable to a statistical model. 
And the 2SD gap reversal, I called Baltimore chop, and that's because of this, right? This is just a simple thing. You'll see in a minute how this relates to trading. Baltimore chop, the Baltimore Orioles, not the new Orioles, the Orioles from a, a long time ago, right? If, if you watch like Ken Burns' uh, History of Baseball, you'll see all about this thing, or you just read up on it. Baltimore Orioles had a trick. If they had a runner, if they had a batter who was a bad runner, Right. What they would do is have him spike the ball down into the ground, pop it over the pitcher's head. And by the time he could field the ball, he made it to first base. So that pattern reminded me of something that happens in trading, which is opening gaps. And opening gaps are a volatility based trade. And volatility is something that we know. Right. We're researchers. We've, we've looked at this stuff over 25 years. Volatility is something that you can manipulate statistically and figure out how to get an edge in your trading. So there's a couple of assumptions that we have to think about. The first one is you have to have a normal distribution in able to, uh, to be able to uh, analyze something statistically and, and in order to then be able to make uh, projections based on those statistics. So you need a normal distribution. We know that market data by and large is normally distributed. It's just outliers that make things uh, uh, not normally distributed. Those are things that are easy to screen for. And then we have to have something that's a good proxy for volatility. Because when we started doing this originally, what we were using was the implied volatility of the front month contract of every single stock on every single exchange. That was just too much data to crunch every night. We had to download all that volatility data, load it into a spreadsheet, and if on any given day we didn't have access to that data, then we were messed up for the next 10 days because the way the model's built. True range, it turns out, is a real good proxy for volatility because it considers the thing that we're actually looking at. And I'm gonna to get to that in a second. The next assumption is that volatility and then its proxy, true range, is mean reverting. And that I'm gonna say there's a ton of research out there that has been done by you know people before me and and people who've come along since that says volatility is definitely mean reverting. And all mean reversion says is you're going to have access to this thing right here. This is the bell shaped distribution, a standard normal distribution it's called. And in statistics, it's the gold standard. So what we know is in the middle of that bell shaped curve is something called mu. It's the arithmetic average. And if you go out one standard deviation, I'll show you how to calculate the standard deviation in a second. One standard deviation in either direction, you've accounted for 68.2% of the, of the average move away from the average that you can expect. So what's that tell you? On average, once we're out one standard deviation, we can expect that 68% of the time, price is going to move back toward the mean before it does anything else. If we go out two standard deviations, what we accounted for is 95% of the volatility that we're going to expect. So 95% of the time, we're going to see a move back toward that average before we see a move out into 3SD, where it's, where it's going to be more like 99% that we're going to get a reversion move. So this is what we're interested in, two standard deviations. This is a number that's easiest to capture in live market data. And... You know, let's take a look at true range because I know some people are probably trying to figure out the difference between what, you know, what's true range, what's range. Range today is just the high minus the low on a daily bar, right? So if that's a daily bar and this is the high price and that's the low price, you know, say if that was $50.10 at the high and $49.40 at the low, then the range for the day was $0.70. Cents. That's a no-brainer. You just subtract $49.40 from $50.10 gives you a 70 cent range. True range is a little something different. So true range takes into account gaps. This is important because, so for you statisticians out there, you guys who, who took statistics when you were in school, what you know is the most important thing when you're applying a statistic to something is that you're actually measuring the thing that you're interested in. And if you're looking at gaps as a function of volatility, then what you want to do is look at the gaps that are on a chart. True range lets you do that. A stock's true range today is just the greater value of that high minus the low 
or the absolute value of the high minus the previous close or the absolute value of the low minus the previous close. So those two things take into, val into account the gaps. The first one is just the range. Whichever one of those values is greater is the one that you're going to look at to get your true range data. And what it does then is in this bar again, you had that high. In the previous bar, you had this close. Well, now if the high was 5010 and the low on the previous day was 49 bucks, or the close on the previous day was 49 bucks, then the true range was a dollar and 10 cent, right? That's one day's true range. So if your software only does average true range, what you wanna do is change the average number to one. So you're just looking at one day worth of data. And then that gives you all those true range values that you can plug into this formula that I'll show you in a second. And mean reversion, for those of you who you know aren't familiar with that term, that's a real simple one, that's a no brainer. The black line, in the middle of, you know, let's call this data market data here, pretend that's a chart. That just represents the mean, the arithmetic average of the, the true range data that you're looking at. The red balloons and the blue balloons, that is high volatility versus mean reversion. So you've got periods of high volatility. You've got periods where volatility is moving back toward the mean. Doesn't mean you're going to get back to the mean. Doesn't mean you're going to get back below, you know, the prior sessions uh, open or close or high or low or whatever. It just means you're going to move toward it. And this is something in statistics very well accepted, applies to pretty much any kind of number set, any kind of data set you're looking at, whether you're used to doing statistical process control, uh, you know, in some industry, in aerospace or at a factory somewhere or whatever, or you're looking at human behavior, you know that mean reversion is something that happens in any kind of data that's normally distributed. So you're just going to take that information then to construct the indicator, and then I promise we'll get into some examples of how it works. This is the last time you're going to have to calculate this thing. Take a look here. One standard deviation is what we're going to calculate by using this formula here. And we take each day's true range and put that in for X, we're gonna use 10 days worth of data. And then we subtract the average X, so the average true range. And then we square that number to get rid of a negative value. And we divide it by N, the number of days that we're looking at. You could do N minus one if you're a you know, pure statistician, you're looking at degrees of freedom, but you don't really have to with this uh, data set size. You take the square root of that, and that gives you one standard deviation. We're interested in two standard deviations. So you multiply that two standard devi that one standard deviation, I'm sorry, by two, that gives you a two standard deviation value. So how, what's this do for you? So here's a sample calculation, right? If these are the true range values for a stock, right? On day one, it moved a dollar and three cents for true range. Day two, 62 cents. Day three, 60. Day four, right? All the way down the list. And this is our formula. If we take these numbers and we plug them in for X, and then we take this average number, right? That's the average of day one through 10. Just add those together, divide it by 10. That gives you 1.25. Divide it by the total of number of people who, who or the total number of observations, which is going to be 10. And then take the square root of that. That gives us one standard deviation. One standard deviation is 49 cents. Two standard deviations is going to be 98 cents. We add that to our average of $1.25, that gives us $2.23 in this case would be how much this stock has to gap in order for us to have 95% confidence that we were gonna get a move back toward the average before we had another move in the direction of the gap, right? So this is a, it is, it's not a no brainer as far as the, the statistics go or the math goes, but it's also not very complicated math. A lot of you guys are engineers, right? This, this is a, a total one-off for you, but you know, you guys who aren't, just know this is what's going on behind the curtain. This is how the decision is being made for us to go and fade a gap back in the direction of the opening tick. So the rules for the trade are going to be really simple. Stock gaps open. We go two standard devi deviations above or below the close of yesterday's bar. Then we're going to enter the trade just above the high or below the low of the deepest bar in the gap. So think of the gap as a pullback. Just think of the gap as a, a standard, like one, two, three, stair step kind of a pullback. And what you get is something that looks like this. So pretend these are five-minute bars. There's an idealized version of this thing. And on a five-minute chart, 
That last bar off on the left side where they're going up, that's yesterday's data. And then today we open and we gap lower. And we find out from our software, whether it's TradeStation or, or you know, Thinkorswim or, or you're using a spreadsheet or you're using our scanner or, or you know, whatever you're using, you find out, okay, this stock just gapped 2 SD in terms of volatility. So what are we going to expect? Well, we know it's not going to immediately react because the opening bell in particular tends to really, you know, have some, some uh, uh, volume behind it. There's, there's a lot of reactivity to what's happening right on the open. We're going to look for the bar that has, in the case of a gap down, the lowest high. So you see how that's like a stair step down. You've got a first gap bar that's the gap, a second bar that moves lower, a third bar moves lower. Lowest high is that fourth bar. And what the rule is telling you is, you want to get long in this case. I'm going to show you some shorts in a second here from yesterday. You want to get long just a tick above the high of the deepest bar in that in that move. And then you're just going to get out right around the high or the, the low, the open, the close, you know, something major that happened in the first bar of trading. And why did I call it Baltimore Chop? Well, because to me, that looks a lot like that old Baltimore Orioles trick, spiking the ball down into the ground and popping it higher. So that's all great, right? So now you know the math behind it. And you know this has been a mainstay for Julie and me for 25 years. We've got guys who work with us who only trade this trade. I don't advise it, right? I always say you should trade all the stuff because, you know, this is most prevalent during earnings season. And, you know, when you're not in earnings, it can start getting frustrating because there's fewer and fewer that are available. But much of the year, there's good opportunity to be found with this thing. How do you find the opportunity? You're going to have to have something that goes and parses the data. So this scanner um, is one that we developed that we have on the site. This separates, I like to focus on the S&P 500, the S&P 400, and I like to know what stocks are in the news. This particular scanner will go through, it'll tell you, did something in the five or the four gap, is it on earnings, and are they being widely disseminated on the news feeds? And in this case, this was yesterday. So which direction would you assume that I was looking to take reversion moves yesterday, right? Am I looking for things that gap down because yesterday had a lot of gaps down and we were looking to go long in that case? Or was I looking for things that gapped up and then were giving me the opportunity to short the market? So if you're thinking about that, all right, I'll spoil it for you. My focus was on the short side of the market. So why was that? Because with the, with the big move to the downside, and stocks that gapped higher, right? All this stuff in the red gapped higher. If the market continued to weigh on stocks, the best probability I thought of catching a sympathy move was on things that had gapped higher, particularly in the case of things that had gapped higher on news. So that's why I focused on that bottom right uh, box in our scanner yesterday. And then you know, it's just a matter of taking each one of those stocks. So in the room, you know, I'm going to do all this for you. I'm going to go through and just tell you, well, these are the ones I'm focused on and I'll highlight them and everything. But in that bottom uh, box, there's four stocks. One of them, you see, when we look at the opening bar, this happened. So any of these trades, it's a full five minutes into trading before we even start looking at placing a reversion trade. When I see something like this happen on an open, I know immediately that's either, you know, one of two things, a very fast market, which I don't want to be a part of, or that's a stray tick on the opening bell. And the reality is, you know, it's not two standard deviations out. But when you see a bar like that, right, the pattern's already wiped out, we're not going to look at that one. The next one, this one is a $5 stock. Those of you who uh, since we're looking at the short side of the market on, on these trades in particular, right? Those of you who short the market, you know, stocks that are under $5, a lot of times they can't be part of the holdings of mutual funds. Mutual funds are where we borrow these stocks from typically. Therefore, going to be hard to borrow. I'm not going to look at it. 
So you could say, well, why wouldn't you just trade 10 times the share size on a $5 stock? It made a beautiful move. It did the mean reversion, right? Everything about it is perfect, but going to be hard to borrow. So I'm not going to waste my time with it. The ones that did make sense, right? We had five, nine incorporated. So this one has a couple of things going on for it that um, make it interesting. First off, it, it tends to gap sort of frequently. And it's been on our radar, you know, quite a bit. And we, we really follow the stock when it gaps. And it's been a good player, right? So it, it, it tends to have a problem on the open where, you know, in that opening bar, the spreads are $1, $1.20, $1.30 right at the opening bell. But by the time you're five minutes into it, it's normalized. It's trading on 10 or 15 cent spreads. I'm going to look at that spread and figure out then how much slippage am I going to have to allow for the trade. But that's all stuff you can learn, right? There's all stuff that's very learnable, very doable. You just have to focus on it. And again, take into account that now you're using an indicator that actually puts probability on your side versus just throwing a bunch of squiggly lines on the chart and saying, well, you know, let, let's see what's going to happen here. This is all about clarity. I've got price, I've got volume, and I've got volume by price. I'm going to show you how I use those three things to figure out where price is going next. So here's that first bar in the gap. That's, we've got a two standard deviation move higher, and then the stock comes down and it hits that orange line. So that's going to be the low of the gap to the upside. The second bar also puts in a low and then bounces higher. So again, I'm moving my potential entry up, right? Because I'm always going to look for the potential to enter at the low of the current bar if the next bar violates it. When I get up to this bar, bar number four, now what I see is if I get a violation of that orange line, I'm going to look to short the stock and I'm going to look to short it into something significant that happened in the first bar, right? So since it's a short, it's either going to be the close of that opening bar or the low of that opening bar since that's what's happening down at the bottom of the range. We're going to refine that just a bit more in a few seconds. But here's how the decisions were made. So that line is going to be the entry price. So we've got now $185.11 is the short sale entry price. That's the threshold. That's the highest low in that little pullback that we see off the opening bell. Then if we come down and we look at, all right, where was their significant price activity after the open that was pushing price higher? You see that red line I just dropped down there? That is right on a resistance line, right? That seems to be a place that price is inflecting before it goes and pops another dollar, dollar fifty to the upside, and then possibly all the way back up into the range of the first bar. So I'm going to put my stop right at that level. And if you want a little bit more confirmation, you can break it down to a one minute chart. And in this case, on the one minute chart, this is actually the bar that we're looking at. That's the bar that triggered the entry. And a lot of times I like to use an entry bar high as a stop loss. If you drill down to a one minute, you can do a bunch of confirmations and you can see that on the right side of the chart, there are those light green bars. That's volume by price data. Volume by price tells you at this price, how many shares went off at that price, how many shares went off. And you can see that to get above the high of that current bar, I'm going to have to go and just, you know, drill through a bunch of junk that is going to make it uh, a pretty firm resistance level. And that if it gets up above that, it's likely to try and press back up into the opening range. So these are the things that I find confluent in, you know, confluence is an overlap of indications that we're seeing when we're looking at a stock. Right there is where I see that volume by price lined up with the stop that I set in the last in the last chart, in the five-minute chart. So I'm just looking at a couple things. I'm looking at a one-minute, a five-minute, and then I'm trying to gauge how likely is it that if price moves against me and it hits a stop level, that if it gets through that stop, it's going to keep going and, and maybe, you know, wipe out a trade. So this is how I'm setting stops on these. It's really pretty simple stuff. Focus on volume. Focus on volume by price. Look at threshold levels that are easy to identify. Those make for good stop losses. So we got the stop in place, 185.68. We have got a low on the second bar that lines up exactly again with that volume profile, right, with that volume by price data. And we see, 
you know, we could go and say we want to target the low of the first bar of the tra- of trading, and it certainly hit that low after it triggered. But when price came down in the second bar and it hit this level, this is where it inflected from and traveled higher. So that's my best guess for this is where something is going to happen again. If it does happen, I don't want to be part of it, right? I want to get out. That volume by price area right there is where I'm going to pull the plug. So now I've got a fully structured trade. I have an entry, I have a stop, and I have a target. And, you know, the target here, 184, it's, uh, you know, as I said, off of this inflection. And, you know, when I'm looking at it again, you know, do you want to trail that stop? Maybe, you know, this, you can try to catch down at the bottom of that next bar. Do you want to trail it down in one of those pivot lines? I don't know, maybe. But the reality is, if you're watching a few of these things, you're not going to have a time for all those maybes. You're going to have, you're going to have, you know, the time is going to be limited enough that you've got to set up these orders. And once you've got them in there, you're just going to move on to the next trade. So in my case, the way that I put the orders together is with a bracket order. You can do this with, uh, you know, any quantity of shares. And, um, you know, what you're going to want to do is set a stop and a limit based on what the current spread is, right? So the bid to the ask and then also you want to look at the bid down to the next bid and then down to the next bid and just see you know, how liquid is the market. Are there, you know, is, is everybody showing one share? Are they showing hundreds? Are they showing thousands? So how liquid is the market in this stock going to be? And what that then allows you to do, right, is I'm saying 185.11 is going to be my stop price. That's the price that we activate at. So we're going to sell short 185.11. 184.99 limit. So this 99 limit price over here, 184.99, that's the worst price that we're willing to accept on this entry. So about, uh, uh, you know, 12 cents in slippage at the most. That's based on the spread in the market is about an eighth of a point. We see that we're likely to get a slip. We want to control the slip as much as we can and then get the rest of the parameters for the trade in. We can see we've got a stop loss set. So the 180, uh, uh, 185.68 stop is in. The 184 target is in. You can do a bunch of things. I mean, you could set this to, you know, get you out different quantities. You could get out for half at your profit objective and, you know, let the other half run. There's all sorts of things you can do. I just always advise just set the trade up so that it's going to get you in and out where you think the most likely inflections are going to be. So 25 years or, or 26 years or whatever it's been, I've, I've really never had very good luck with coulda, woulda, shoulda. Like the best thing for me to do is focus on what's right in front of me and what's most likely to happen. So and that's the way you set this one up. So, right, end of the trade, you knew ahead of time. So if you're trading 1,000 shares, you knew ahead of time you had $990 that you stood to make versus 690 that you stood to, loss, uh, to lose. 100 shares, you stood to make 99 bucks. So to lose $69, you know, 10 shares, whatever, you know, whatever it is that you're working with, the key to doing this is getting good at it, getting good at applying the statistic, understanding where you think this thing is going to go, and then going through and, you know, you guys who have seen, uh, you know, Julie's stuff or, or some of the things that we do together live, it's, uh, it's all about figuring out where you're psychologically comfortable bunch of people can show you things they do to make money in the markets or things that they say they do to make money in the markets. It's up to you to decide whether it's something you can do to make money in the markets. And it has to be in your comfort zone or you have to adjust your comfort zone, right? You have to start working on things psychologically and say, look, you know, it's, I understand what my probability is here for a gain. I understand what the probability is for a loss. I see what it does over time. Am I comfortable with that? If I'm not comfortable with that, I'm not going to go and adjust my stops. What I'm going to adjust is my position sizing. Because over time, what will happen is, you know, we're both psychologists. Over time, what will happen is you'll see things enough times that it enters your comfort zone, even if it wasn't there initially. Let's look at another one from yesterday, right? This is the final one. I was going to go through all four of those, make sure everybody sees that, you know, we didn't cherry pick them. Here's flow. So... SPX Flow Incorporated, this is an even cleaner example. So you've got this gap to the upside, very, very clear inflection, very clear bounce at the, uh, at the bottom there of the, of the first bar. Follow that to the upside. Here's the next higher low. 
follow that to the upside, you've got two bars that make a combined low. Once that's in, right, you know that your job is just to set up the bracket order. You have to figure out where's my entry, where's my stop, where's my target. So again, you know, when I'm talking to the guys or when I'm talking to you folks in, uh, you know, we're going to do this war room thing and, and this is going to be focused on on this. We've had rooms that kind of went all over on us and covered, you know, all the bases and, and they just don't work out as well. I just want to focus on some skills and tactics that are going to be easier for people to succeed with. And this is one of them. Once we have this in, next thing you're going to hear me talking about is just, okay, this is how I'm going to set this trade up and here's why. So you know 79.47 is the low of those two bars. That's going to be the entry price. That's our threshold price. $79.47 is where we want to short the market in FLOW. Then if you go up above the highs and you just start pulling a line down, right, right about here, you see a couple of things that line up. You see the next bar tried to push up higher from there and encountered a bunch of volume. Look off on the right side of the chart. You see that big green bar sticking out right at that level? That tells you there was overhead supply that was pushing down like crazy on this stock. What's that tell you? It's a good place to put your stop loss. So now we've got an $80.05 stop, right? This one looks even better than the last one. Now we've got a very, very tight stop loss on what stands to be, it looks like anyways, a, a pretty decent sized potential profit. So let's go and figure out if this level right here, the low of the first bar of trading, the way that it lines up with volume by price data off to the right tells us that this is most likely gonna be a good place to put our profit objective, 7807. Does it go lower? Right? Does it get down into the 75s? Absolutely. Do I care? No. Because, again, coulda, woulda, shoulda is something that, you know, a lot of my guys are guilty of. And I keep saying it doesn't matter where the market goes. It does not matter how much you want to make. It does not matter how much you're willing to lose. Right? Market doesn't care. The only thing the market cares about is, do you know where the likely inflections are going to be? And if you can identify those likely inflections, can you maneuver your way in and out of the market in a way that's going to make sense, right, so that you've got the opportunity to profit from what's going on? So look at the way this one's set up and just ask yourself, right, in terms of the probability distribution, do you understand, first off, what the significance is of we're two standard deviations out in terms of volatility? So the answer should be, yeah, I know I've got a 95% confidence interval around what I'm doing here that says most likely price is going to move back down into the range. I don't know that it's going to go close the gap. I don't know what it's going to do. I don't know that all that heavy volume off on the right side of the chart over there is going to be there. The only thing that I know is it's likely to make a move back into some significant portion of the early trading. So why is that first inflection there so important to me at 7807? It's because that's where the buyers stepped in, right? That's where price pushed higher. That's where when price fell down there, somebody was willing to say, even in light of this gap, I'm willing to pick these shares up right here. So when price gets back down there again, to keep statistics and probability on our side, what we want to say is, first off, we don't even know how far that reversion has taken us at this point, right? We might be less than two standard deviations at that point, right? The, the, the opening tick was two standard deviations. We don't know. We might be one and a half, one through quarter. That changes the amount of probability that we have on our side. What we want to focus on is that was the inflection. That was the ricochet. If that happens again, I don't want to be in front of it, right? I want to be on the way out as that buying pressure would come in. As this one turns out, Buying pressure didn't hit, and, you know, there was another $2.5 to be made on this trade. does not matter to me because I'm already on to the next thing. I'm focused on what's coming next instead of, instead of this trade that's in front of me. If you're handling two of these or three of these or four of these or whatever it is, trust me, you've got your hands full setting this thing right here up. So 
And when you do these bracket orders, you know, I'll just tell you, it's it's going to be dependent on the platform that you're in. I use Realtek, and you know, Realtek has has its uh, um, well, it's definitely got its upsides. It's it's probably the best pro trader platform out there, in in my opinion, anyways. In in terms of downsides, you have to know what you're doing, right? So when I'm setting up a bracket order in Realtek and I say, okay, here's my stop, here's my limit. I've got about a 10 cent spread on this that's based on what's going on in the market. So 79.47 is the activation price. 79.37 is the worst slip that I'm willing to take on this trade. So what about the route? What order route am I gonna use? So I have my guys either use EQLS in this case it's through this this one's through Lightspeed this this so Realtek is uh, is going to be um, a broker independent right so it's it's usable with a lot of different brokers it's a, a professional piece of software so you can use it with uh, you know Lightspeed Cobra Trading you know Deutsche Bank Barclays you know you can use this stuff sort of anywhere that that uh, that you can park the money that has the capability to to get its hooks into it but when you're looking at this I've got it routed EQLS and I've got an expiring day. So it's important to know what expirations your software accepts on an order route. So if I had an EQLS order with a day expiration in, and then under the exit order, I had an expiration of good till cancel, what had happened is on this particular order route, I would get a mismatch and it would reject the trade. And I would think I was good to go. And in reality, the trading software puts the order out to the route and if the route isn't compliant with whatever it is that you're trying to do, you're going to be out of luck. You're not going to get the trade off. So there's skills, right? There's skills you have to learn for every type of trading software that you're using. If you're using Realtek with uh, interactive brokers, it's going to be different. If you're using IB's native platform, it's going to be different. Know the order routes. There's a ton of them, right? You could route through ARCA. You could route direct to the NASDAQ. It's flow. It's a NASDAQ listed security. If you know it's a NASDAQ listed uh, stock, you can shave over a tenth of a second off of your execution price or off your execution timing just by routing directly to the exchange. But, you know, let's say you've got gaps, S&P 5s, S&P 4s, and some of them are NYSE, some of them are NASDAQ, and you go and you route to the wrong exchange, it's going to have the opposite effect. So I tell people all the time, and Julie says all the time, too, you're going to have to be good at what you do, right? Our guys, we've got plenty of guys who are making a living trading. They're good at what they do. They've put in the time. They've put in the practice. They know their software. They know what to expect. People who are new to this stuff, right, every five minutes, you know, oh, I got a slip. You know, I don't know about the slippage that I got. It's, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, it would make sense to you if, if you just had enough time in front of the screen to see this is how much things typically slip. When Julie and I started trading, eighth of a point was a great slip. That's 12 and a half cents. Quarter point was an acceptable slip. That's 25 cents. Things have changed. People accept, expect smaller slips now, but it's also taken away a bunch of edge that we had in the market, right? You can't work the book the same way, all this kind of stuff. You have to evolve with the market and you, for certain, need to understand your software and the order routes that it's putting you uh, into and out of securities in. So $80.05 was my stop, right? That's there as my buy for a loss. And 7807 is gonna be my profit objective. So the other thing I should tell you is in the case of something like Realtek, right? You're paying commissions and you're paying software fees. Other platforms you're getting for free and you're not paying to trade. And how many of you out there think that anything worth anything is ever given for free. It doesn't happen. So when you see my slips are set up tight, they're set up to the book, you know, why is he able to control his slippage the way he is when every time I put a, a trade in, I lose, you know, I get a 15, 20, 25 cent slip. Well, it's because they're taking the other side of that book. And in this case, you're being routed directly to the market. Routed directly to the market, again, means you're going to need to know your stuff. You need to know what it is that you're trying to get in front of, and you need to know what it is that's likely going to happen based on how you structure this order. But there's all stuff that's knowable. There's all stuff that's doable. And, uh, you know, like I said, we, we've taught a ton of people how to trade over the years. And uh, I tell people all the time, you know, 
you want to talk to one of my clients, you talk to all my clients because this is a realistic approach to trading the markets. You're not going to get rich. You're not going to make a thousand percent overnight. Anybody who tells you they did, you know, you just tell them they didn't um, because it's hard work. And it's not just let's go in there and, uh, you know, loot this thing every day. It's not an ATM machine. This is about trading the markets the way that a market maker trades them instead of trying to trade the way that a retail trader trades them. And what you're certainly never looking for here is, you know, to pull the lever and, and you know, see if you win or buy a lottery ticket. What you're doing is with every one of the trading systems, every one of the trading patterns that uh, that we use, we're trying to anticipate order flow, anticipate where the money is going, anticipate where the money is coming from, dissect, um, you know, the, the reasoning for the buying and selling that's going on, and then put ourselves in a position to profit from the activities of the institutions instead of, uh, you know, trying to uh, trying to go out there and beat the house. All right. So I'll take some uh, I'll take some questions here if you have them. I've got here's here's the offer that we have for you guys. Um, you guys have seen us before. You know we don't usually do offers, but we're going to launch this whole thing as a um, as a service that is bundled with everything that we do that we think is sort of good for the majority of traders. So bundled into this is daily access to that scanner that we have, historical access to all of the scanner data. So you can go back and you can simulate this because the more time you spend in front of a simulator, I'm going to guarantee you the better you're going to get at doing this stuff live. You have to get to where you can recognize it. You have to get to where, you know, when I'm working with you in the room or whatever, you understand how I'm telling you to structure the order, what I'm telling you to do. So you have access to a bunch of the uh, 2SD gap scanner data. And then you also have access to our mainstays. And a lot of people, they gloss over this stuff and then they stop doing it because it's the harder part of trading. So my NYSE and NASDAQ trading plans they're what we've been doing since day one. They've been around. My, my NYSE plan is, is the oldest living trading plan that you're going to find anywhere, I guarantee you. It's the longest run, running thing out there, and it's because it works. And you've got access not only to those plans every day when you get into this, but you've got access to every single plan going back to 2006, every single spreadsheet that shows the results of every single execution. All the trades are put together today for tomorrow. They're all set up just the way I just showed you. Entry, stop, target, right? There's none of this like maximum favorable excursion. Oh, if you would have stayed with it for, you know, for, for 20 hours or for 50 hours or for 100 hours, you would have made this much or, you know, maybe you would have lost this much. It's, this is like all just very, it's in front of you. It's objective. It's very, very easy to analyze and figure out how it works and why it works. And if you take the time to dig into it, what you're going to find out is it's it's a little bit more of a process, right? Because you're trading more like a you trade more like a two dollar broker. You're trading more like a guy down on the floor who's putting these trades together and then setting them out there. You automate them. You put them out there. You have them run, and they're running over the course of the day. But at the end of it, even though it's more work, right? It's something you can actually count on. It's something you can look at and say, "This is why this works. I understand why this is doing this." And yeah, you know what? It's not making me, it's not making me a, 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 a billionaire. I'm not pulling, you know, a thousand percent out of the market every week, but yeah, I'm able to go travel like Julie and Adrian do and, and Connor, and I'm able to go and put these trades together and put them out there and have them take care of themselves and come back and check later, right? Julie and I and, and our son, Connor, we were off in Florence. We were in Venice. We were in, in, uh, in Vienna. We were all over Europe visiting family and just having fun common denominator was walked out the door in the morning, set the things up, came back, found out how they did because you can send the orders out to the exchange via your trading platform and then just come back and monitor, right, what happened. And then we're going to give you daily access to our war room and that's where I'm going to be in there. I'm just going to go through and, and, and pound people with this is the stuff that's on the scanner. I'm going to highlight in yellow. These are the ones that I'm interested in taking. Here's how I'm setting up these trades on the two SDs. We'll talk about the NYSE and NASDAQ uh, trading plans and what we're doing 
uh, you know, as we trade through them. And then after that room is over, you can go and join the other guys in our just, uh, you know, support room for, for subscribers and monitor what's going on with the trades over the course of the day. And, you know, hopefully have a roadmap for success. Cause I'm just really hoping to foster um, success and get from this, some people who are interested with work in, in working with us in the future and, uh, you know, have it make sense for them against that backdrop of they've seen it. They understand it works. They've talked to other people who tell them it works. They've seen it work for other people. They've seen it work for us. They think it fits their psychology. It fits their discipline, their relationship with money. And at that point, right, then you're somebody, maybe we can whittle this down from 600 people applying every year to 200 people applying. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier for us. We're a two person shop here. We're not a big company. Um, but I think, you know, you're going to find out it'll be a good experience for you. So you save a bunch of money. You can sign up for it today. It's, it's going to be 350 a month. You can always cancel if you don't like it. Traderinsight.com forward slash bundle. And then if anybody has questions, I've got about five or six minutes on the clock here to answer some questions for you. Looks like no question. I'm looking at the screen here, so I'm just going to assume this was uh, this was as enlightening as as you could take. Um, so I know this is information dense, and uh, you know I've had people tell me before that uh, it's it's like taking a drink of water from a from a fire hose. But uh, you know I want to be complete. I want to err on the side of giving you all the information. Um, that's going on here, right? We don't do any black boxes. We don't do anything that, uh, you know, that we don't really explain to every single person what it is that, uh, you know, it's your money and it's your time. And the most important thing is that those two things, especially your time, you spend wisely. All right. So I'm going to call it here I'm a couple of minutes early, but I think I started a couple of minutes early. So thanks everybody for coming today. It was a great crowd, right? A bunch of you here. And uh, thank you, David. And hopefully we'll see you guys next time. All right. Great. Thank, thank you, Adrian. All right, buddy. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. All right. So that was our seventh presentation for the day. And we have three more. Uh, three more today. And uh, just a reminder, in case you didn't hear this earlier, I am recording each of the presentations separately, and I'm working on processing those. I already have the first five fully processed and posted, so as soon as we're done tonight, you can start reviewing the, the earlier presentations if you missed any of those. And uh, let's see, we have uh, Marina Viatoro up next, and she should be on in a few minutes. So we're going to just take a short break here. And, and we'll be back at uh, in, in about 10 minutes here.